this last part of session four, I'm going to talk about some ways we can approach examinations of consciousness and conscience in relation to the relation of the new medias to our religious vocation. What I want to look at is how can we have an effective formation in relation to electronic media in terms of what the church is asking of us. Pope Benedict said in 2009, quote, I'm conscious of those who constitute the so-called digital generation. And I would like to share with them in particular some ideas concerning the extraordinary potential of the new technologies. If they are to be used to promote human understanding and solidarity, these technologies are truly a gift to humanity. And we must endeavor to ensure that the benefits they offer are put at the service of all human individuals and communities, especially those who are the most disadvantaged and vulnerable." Unquote. I would say that one of the greatest gifts we have in our religious life is lifelong continuing formation. Sister Mersh has already given some examples of couples, of others, who just don't have that privilege. It's an ex where the really it's the one vocation in the church. Unless you're in a marriage where your husband and wife do it for one another because you really love the other one so much. But in our case, the church has asked this. This is a quotation from Vita Consecrata. Continuing formation, whether in institutes of apostolic or contemplative life, is an intrinsic requirement of religious consecration. As mentioned above, the formation is not limited to the initial phase. Initial formation, then, should be closely connected with continuing formation, thereby creating a readiness on everyone's part to let themselves be formed every day of their lives." Unquote. John Paul II. So while we're talking about the new media, most of us here are finally professed, Again, we have to think of it for ourselves as, are we ready to be formed ourselves every day as part of our continued formation? In the consecrated life, the role of superiors, including local superiors, has always been of great importance for the spiritual life and for mission. I'm quoting from Vita Consecrata, paragraph 43 here. It should be recognized that those who exercise authority cannot renounce their obligation as those first responsible for the community, as guides of their brothers and sisters in the spiritual and apostolic life." Unquote. So it places a great burden on general superiors and local superiors, provincial superiors, in this particular area where the church, I think, is really increasingly, with increasing urgency, asking us to educate and form all those sisters for whom we're immediately responsible. Now, by and large, and we'll come back to this tomorrow, the local, the superior's job is to provide the structures within which the formation occurs. The structure of the community life, the, the formation stages. But each individual sister is primarily responsible for her own willingness to be formed and her, her cooperation with the process. In the first session, I noticed that Pope Pius II encouraged Marshall McLuhan to undertake a serious study of the media. And in his groundbreaking works, this Catholic writer and professor began to describe the impact of the form of new media on the recipient, including, quote, the techniques of communication and the capacity of the individual's own reaction, unquote. And in fact, Marshall McLuhan really himself became convinced that it was the form or the forms of the different medias that were addictive more than the content. But that's where the medium is the message, the famous passage comes from him, and the global village, all these expressions are Marshall McLuhan's. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, especially today where I think the content has actually become very uh, much more aggressive in encouraging you to get attached to it. But at, at that particular point, here's a passage from him. Neither black and white nor color television is a picture. This is in contrast to the older movies whose film was a fast-moving series of pictures. TV is an x-ray. Light comes through the image at the viewer. The viewer is not a camera, but a screen. The TV camera has no shutter. 
but works like a shifting mosaic. Totally different from photographs and movies, the TV image is discontinuous and flat, unquote. And that's from his book called Through the Vanishing Point, Space and Poetry and Painting. Now the TV screen, as a mosaic of dots, as I mentioned just uh, in the last discussion, is more work for the viewer because the viewer has to put the dots together into a picture. The dot pitch of the computer and the television screen contributes to fatigue by its mosaic type structure. And Marsha McLuhan wrote extensively about this in a book called Understanding Media. As I mentioned before, older sisters who weren't grow up, didn't grow up with television sometimes had a lot of trouble engaging with seeing something on screen. And we noticed just even in our own community, they'd fall sound asleep after about 10 minutes of watching a movie while the rest of us were uh, you know, much more attached. And we just couldn't figure out what it was. Um, that's possibly part of the explanation for it. What happens is uh, the Scientific American did a study on different ways of viewing television. And they came up with a conclusion that a sense of relaxation ends when the set is turned off, but the feelings of passivity and lowered alertness continue. Survey participants commonly reflected that television has somehow absorbed or sucked out their energy, leaving them depleted." Unquote. And that's in an article called Television Addic Addiction in Scientific American in February 2002. Now that's just looking at the form. We're not looking at the content yet, but just the form. So that a lot of people have that response to television. They find it relaxing, but they sit and watch for hours, two or three hours, and when they finish, they don't feel refreshed. They just feel tired. I can say that's I've had that experience, and especially if the programs don't have elevating content. Um, so you, if you, again, if you examine yourself, you can just see what your response is. If there's meaning in the content and it's elevated then you may leave feeling quite uplifted. But you have to observe your response and then think about, well, what was it? It was just doing nothing <laughs> for a while, which is great, but is that the best way to be refreshed? McLuhan noted that the tendency towards excessive use of electronic media appeared to follow from its forms. Quote, the urge to continue use is quite independent of the content of public programs or of the private sense life. So, People you know sometimes just go home and watch television for hours. And I think this is a real problem. We talk a bit in the seminary about it for f priests that live alone, you know, after a really exhausting day. Um, you try to encourage them to come up with other ways of having a better re re recreation and refreshment. A desire for the more extreme forms of media experience in young people is described by Sister Prokes when she considered how the immersion virtual reality head-mounted displays increased a self-centered experience and cut off visual and audio sensations from the real world outside in order to replace them with computer-generated sensations, unquote. And this is from her book called At the Interface, Theology and Virtual Reality. She's a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist. It's a good book. And uh, she's, but this is, she's looking at young people and particularly where they just love this sense that there's no sensation other than this head monitor. Now McLuhan talked about a law that occurs in terms of the interaction of the form of the media with the powers or faculties of the human being. And here's what he said. Because there's an equilibrium in sensibility, when one area of experience is heightened or intensified, another is diminished or numbed. Present communication technologies supplant man's external senses and more recently even the internal senses of imagination and the most important central or common sense. This brings the various data of the external senses together into a cohesive unity. This involves a process called auto-amputation. And here's what he says further. High-tech television screens and powerful amplification systems produce such vivid colors and loud sounds that this anesthetizes other internal powers. A quote, if a technology gives new stress or ascendancy to one or another of our senses, the ratio among all of our sensors is altered. But any sense, when stepped up to high intensity, can act as an anesthetic for the other senses, unquote. 
and he actually did studies, I think, dentist office and things like that. If you have certain other things, sounds on, you don't worry about when something else so much. So um, it's one of the things that he noticed that with these increasing intensity of the media variations that we, we have to look at. So what happens then, he says, is the human person has to work very hard to keep that equilibrium and balance and to provide continuity from within the self when the sense stimulation outside the self is fast moving. He observes that, quote, when things change at very high speeds, a need for continuity develops. You see, you're in such a complete discontinuity at high speed, everything you're looking at now is gone in a second, unquote, which I think also, Sister, might fit into that example you brought up of the airplane thing. It's too fast. He's, and again, most of us have this experience, I think I surely speak for myself, sometimes these news programs where you have the little ticker tape going below this way, and if you're doing election time, you've got three or four people talking to different people, and you kind of sit there, and you think, oh my gosh, I can't put it together. So what you do in that case is you give up, and you may just focus on one, the line across the bottom or the whatever, but it's, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of work to try to keep that continuity and keep yourself centered in it. The other thing that happens too is sometimes you may realize that many people leave on television as background noise in their home all the time. If you ever visit people that are sick or whatever, it's so irritating if it's not something, but to them it's just sort of, what do they call it, white noise or something like that. They just need to have that on there. That's the form, okay, now the content. Although Marshall McLuhan focused on the uh, empirical side of human interactions, he emphasized that the medium is the message. But Bernard Lonergan, a Jesuit, also Canadian author, said he felt more important than the form was the content. And in particular, what we want are intelligent and rational levels of consciousness which reveal the content of the message. And that's what refreshes us. I think, again, if you watch a really beautiful movie, uh, or a video on the life of a saint, and it's just, you just feel so moved by it afterwards. One of the things that also has happened in the last few years, which has certainly changed from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, is that the content has just simply become dreadful of a lot of things that are on television and in the videos. We, it, it, what the church says is there's a common acceptance of sin as normal, the relativism with respect to truth, the shallow focus of many programs. The news has become more like entertainment than news. It often includes sins, detraction, calumny, slander. Violence and pornography jump out both at the TV and the computer screen un at the unsuspecting viewer, or even at someone who's simply answering their emails or trying to delete them. And this is a big change in the last few years. So the church is well aware of these rapid developments in the media communication, and it's consistently asking those who make the media communications to make better choices for the common good of the community. And just one example by John Paul II, television can harm family life by propagating degrading values, models of behavior, broadcasting pornography, graphic descriptions of brutal violence, inculcating moral relativism, religious skepticism, spreading distorted, distorted, manipulative accounts of news events and current issues, carrying exploitative advertising that appeals to base instincts, glorifying false visions of life that obstruct the realization of mutual respect or justice and of peace. That was the 28th World Communication Day message. Pope Benedict, uh, in his few messages, he's only had a few now, and they're very interesting. He's He's very aware of the difficulties, but he's really focusing on how can we elevate our experience. He talked about the transcendentals all the time. He's talking about beautiful, true, and good as criteria for evaluating the content. And here's a statement from him. Media education should be positive. Children exposed to what is aesthetically and morally excellent are helped to develop appreciation, prudence, and skills of discernment. Beauty, a kind of mirror of the divine, inspires and vivifies young hearts and minds, while ugliness and coarseness have a depressing impact on attitudes and behavior. 
In the light of truth, authentic freedom is experienced as a definitive response to God's yes to humanity, calling us to choose, not indiscriminately, but deliberately, all that is good, true, and beautiful. 41st World Communication Day. It's a beautiful. You know, he loves music. He loves art. He's very... So his, his um, messages each one of these years is just focusing on how can we do this in the context of the contemporary culture. I'm going to give you now, just to finish, a few ex possible suggestions for self-examination. John Paul II said, again, parents ought to teach children to give very serious thought to the problem of the use of social communications media by developing their critical sense. We hear this over and over again. Also, he said, it's important, it's necessary for everyone to make more active use of their critical faculty. And then finally, man, even in the presence of mass media, is called to be himself, that is, free and responsible, a user and not an object, critical and not passive. So I think the first thing we have to ask ourselves when we're viewing is, are we also engaging our critical mind at the same time as we're receiving the media? And we have to develop this habit of doing this. The Pontifical Council of the Social Communications identified one of its current challenges, a whole section on at this, as the need for a critical evaluation of mass media. And so over and over, again, asking for active participation, not passive absorption. With passive absorption, what happens is you become centered in a narcissistic, self-referential world of stimuli with near narcotic effects. So that's from Ethics in the Internet. So there are many examples I won't go through anymore, but that's the first thing is our, our obligation to take a critical attitude. So we need to ask ourselves, as we can, just to develop a habit of, of have we done this, are we doing this, how so? Newman says, strange as it may seem, multitudes call Christians go through life with no effort to obtain a correct knowledge of themselves. Newman offers further insights with the force of habit and making bad choices. The more we ignore our conscience, it soon ceases to upbraid us. Now, the question of conscience, if you're watching a video and some content comes in that's really opposed to church teachings, what do you do? Fast forward, just sit there, take it in. It depends on what you're watching, whom you're watching with. But again, that's something within a particular community you can talk about. One of the things that I suggest the seminarians use with um, teenage boys, for example, is to take the list of the Ten Commandments, make a chart, and put uh, the positive side, you know, honor God with your whole heart, your whole soul, and so on. And then you put on the other side, where was God's name taken in vain? And you just take a half-hour program. You know, you take each one of the commands, theft, adultery, I mean, you name it, you know. Uh, you look at them and just have them keep track of how many times God was honored in this program, the mother and father were honored, how many times were people, you know, obeying the laws of God, how many times were they broken, and that's all you have to do, and they'll see like 10, 15, 20 on this side, maybe one or two here, if at all. And all of a sudden, they start becoming aware of how the Ten Commandments are constantly broken day in and day out in one hour of program, a half hour program. So that's a, a little mini exam that you can use, you know, in school with school projects or things like that. Again, on the other side too, you can even say, let's look at what, uh, how often does a program show self-giving love, self-sacrificing love. Some of the great old movies in the 50s, you know, somebody would sacrifice everything for the person they loved. These days it's almost selfish love. Let them look at love based on utility, pleasure, or really virtue, the true good of the other. Let them count the number of times that things were done in this little program and see what it turns out to be. And what if you just do that, they'll come to the conclusion themselves of what the media is doing to them, the examples it's giving over and over of a really immoral life. But they love discovering it then. It's like they make a, it's, it makes it fun for them instead of saying, well, you're bad because you watch this. So again, we have to see for ourselves first, but a lot of us are more working and forming others. Cardinal Dulles says, and this again talks a little bit about a question that came up earlier. 
Accustomed to surfing, we lose our ability to focus on anything in particular. We switch from one perspective to another rather than consistently following up any one point of view. Having more choices at our fingertips than we can seriously appraise, we lose our capacity for profound and permanent commitments and our taste for sustained analysis." Unquote. And this was in an article he wrote before he died called Catholics in the World of Mass Media. So I think these are just some examples. We're going to be giving more, Sister and I, of, of examples of ways of doing practical exams as we do further sequences. But it just kind of introduces to the area we have to look at how does the form of the media affect us, how does the content affect us, or those for whom we're responsible. So I think I'll stop at this point. Thank you.